For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. moment of silence as believe a priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin if necessary. But if necessary, you should look at mental attitude sins, overt sins, sins of the tongue. The Holy Spirit will certainly, he since he's grieved, you will certainly know it if you're a spiritual person. Then you confess it according to 1 John 1, 9. And you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse and restore you to fellowship of verse 5. That was 1 John 1, 9. And then you get something out of the Bible study. It's amazing to me that I go to church prepared no matter, no matter who's speaking and no matter what their subject, I go prepared to learn something and I'm never disappointed. He can always teach us if we have ears to hear and hearts to believe. Well, Father, we're thankful today for your grace and how thankful we are, Father, for Christians that have the maturity to go through really difficult things in life and, and still praise God and just have a thankful heart that God chose them for the journey. I mean, that's an amazing thing. Unbelievers, they, they don't understand this. Many Christians don't. But boy, when you have eyes to see and ears to hear, it's a pretty amazing thing to see the modern-day Jobs. And I'm thankful to be a part of their lives and part of their journey. And I pray tonight, Father, as we look at the study of agape love and how Jesus Christ brought it under a new commandment into the new covenant and into the church, it is the dynamic word. I mean, he, he put this word, he took it out of mothballs and it became the dynamic word of the church. And I pray it would be the dynamic word of our church and for those who listen with us, study with us through the scriptures in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we're in... Um, we're in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter and verse 7. And we've been discussing reaching spiritual maturity and maintain it. When you reach spiritual maturity and maintain that level of spiritual growth, you're going to click into the what we call super grace. You're going to get into super growth ministry. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.3, among many, many words that talk about it. But Paul talks about, in the context of chapters 8 and 9, Paul talks about in chapter 7, he talks about six characteristics of super grace that are important for the context of chapters 8 and 9. So we pull those six out in our study on spiritual growth maturity, the four stages, and then we're dealing with the fourth stage, teleos, or spiritual maturity adult. And last night we did an introduction study on this subject matter to make sure that you understand how Jesus took this out of mothballs and put it as a, a dominant principle of the new covenant and the church age. And we saw him do that at the Last Supper in John 13, 34, and 35. We studied that last night. And then we studied it, uh, how he took it out of the mouthballs in Matthew, 22nd chapter of Matthew, uh, when he discussed uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, and then said, uh, the, these are the two laws that sum up the Old Covenant, and he says the word that sums it all up is uh, agape love. And, and, and listen, Paul understood that. I want to show you how...
understood it uh, on the same thing. I want you to go to Romans with me, and then I want to get, I want to move from there. But I want to go to Romans 13, and and Paul picks Paul picks this up, and watch what Paul does with the word agape connected to De to the Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 18 that we studied last night. We studied uh, John 13 and we studied Matthew 22 and we studied um, uh, Luke 10 and the parable of the Good Samaritan to show the whole link. But we're in the 13th chapter, verse 8, 9, and 10. When I watch what Paul does with this. But Paul stood, understood exactly what Jesus had done. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to love, there's our word, to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now, we, we know that based on what Jesus taught. He says, and then he goes into verse 9, talks about the law, you'll not commit adultery, not murder. He goes through the Big Ten uh, uh, part of it, the man side part of it. And if there is any other commandment, it is, listen, and if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Now, he just, he just did Leviticus um, 1918 and talks about how Le uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 1918 sums up the law. That, that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He said upon, upon the, the whole law, it can be summed up in, in that. Now watch what he does. Now watch verse 10 because this is really important. And he said, love, and he's talking about agape, the, this love. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, see? And we talked about that. That's the reason we use Luke 10. You remember the Good Samaritan? It's not that love doesn't do a wrong to a neighbor. Listen, uh, it, it, listen, love creates you to be a good neighbor. And that was what the Samaritan became a good neighbor, didn't he? Uh, and then listen to what Paul says. He says, agape love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Hey, listen, Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, he says all of the old covenant can be summed up in this. And then he said the whole law can be summed up in what they were teaching, and that is agape love, Septuagint translation. The Septuagint translated the Hebrew word love by agape. Um, we studied all that last night. I'm just, I'm showing you that Paul understood that because he made it the word of the new covenant based on what Jesus had taught. So we discussed all that last night. So we're back to looking at this. We looked at Pistis faith. We looked at Logos word we looked at gnosis knowledge. We looked at spude earnestness or diligence. We are now looking at agape. And, and so, you know, if you're following along with me, here's what, here's what Jesus did. Look, look down in your paper where it says John 13, 34. Now, we talked about this last night. I'm just coming back to it. A new commandment I give you. Jesus said, that you love one another. There it is. And then he tells you, even as I loved you. See, that he's brought that whole concept into this idea of, the, of, of, the, of love. See, before, listen, he brought a new standard. I mean, how did the old standard work? Well, the old, old standard work, see, Leviticus 6, 5, where it says, uh, love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all your mind, right? What you often miss because you don't, you know, pe we're more New Testament oriented. We're New Covenant people, not Old Covenant. So we spend a whole lot more time in the details of the New Covenant. But what's missing is that if you go to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, it's a Shema. That's a Shema passage. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Boy, when you hear that, the trumpet sounds, and boy, you better gather to listen. Well, he, he, when he, this is Deuteronomy 6, is a, it's a Shema, S-H-E-M-A. It's a Shema. It's, hear, O Israel. 
And he's going to say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you are to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. See, it's part of a Shema. That's, that's, that's as big as it gets in the Old Testament. A Shema. And a Shema requires you to obey the law. You understand? The, the Shema, when it was given, Hear, O Israel, do this, do that. The law requires obedience. Do you understand that? That's not what Jesus said. So he, he, he departs from that idea. He sets a new standard with this word love. Because you see, when he said Deuteronomy 6, 5, it was part of the Shema. It was part of the Shema. Um, well, when you read Deuteronomy 6, you will see that when you hear a Shema, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to respond by obeying it. Hear, O Israel. I mean, hear, O Israel. And so you perked up your ears because... So th that's very important. So what I'm saying to you, when he says, I'm establishing a new commandment off from two old ones. Are you with me? He says that you're to love one another even as I have loved you. And that's a new standard for this. N not because you obey, right? You're to love just as I have loved you. Right? Now, we know that's the cross, don't we? Right? I mean, we know that. Just as I have loved you. And that's where we get the idea of sacrificial, unconditional love as a, as a definition of agape. The truth of the matter is, the true definition is all of, all of your being. You're to love, when he says agape, he means all of your being. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. It is all of oneself. And let me tell you, this gets pretty tough because there are passages in human relationships when he demands that you love somebody this way. For example, husbands love your wife. It's agape. And he even goes and says, as I have loved you. You're to love them just as I have loved you. You're to love your wife just as I have loved you. It's, it's, he comes back to that standard bearer. And it means you're not to love her conditionally. You're to love her unconditionally. You're not to love her unsacrificially. You're to love her sacrificially. And you're to love her with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. I mean, that's all there was under the old covenant. That's the total package. So when you think agape from now on, it means to love. When he says, I want you to agape, it means whatever that is, he means I want every bit of you. I want the total package engaged in that, that, that experience. Huh? I ain't making this up now. Come on. I showed you. He says that, right? I mean, all right. So uh, a new standard, it, it, this thing, it, it, we're motivated to love. When God tells us to love agape, we're motivated not by the law. We're motivated by his death on the cross for us. That's the way he demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Not, not not just God's love towards us, but also his love towards us, right? And, and that's our motivation under the new covenant. This word agape has a new standard, a new standard by which we apply agape love. And listen, it is the dominant, it is the dominant idea of the new covenant. To get there, Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Now watch. Watch, watch on your paper. 
I want you to circle, every time you see the word live or life, I want you to circle it, it's Zoe. In other words, when he says eternal life, that's what he's talking about. He's t that, this is exactly, when he, in context, what he's talking about. He says, it is no longer, it is no longer, because, because I've been crucified, I have, if, if you're a believer, you have been crucified with Christ. As a result of that, of, as a result of understanding that, I no longer, right, I no longer, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life, Zoe, this is the life. See, we've got verbs showing us how the Zoe life is lived, right? See, it's no longer I who live, that's the verb. When we get to life, that's the noun. The verbs are showing us the, the lifestyle of this word, life. What does it mean to have life with Christ? What does it mean? What does eternal life mean? And so he says, it means that I am, I am no longer, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the human area of my life, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, agape, and delivered himself up for me. See, five times. See, that's, that's a dominant idea, isn't it? If you've got a word in one verse used five times. I mean, you've got to understand when he gets through that he's talking about how you live your life. Since you have been crucified with Christ, you have, you have believed that, you're part, that he died there in your place, and now you live in his. He died in your place so you could live in his place, his place on earth. Don't you see that? Okay. Huh. I've been crucified with Christ. My life, I, I live. He died in my place. I live in his place. And the dominant part of that is love. It's how we treat other people. It's how we love other people. And it's not based on how the world tells us to love. It's based on how God tells us to love. Today, I'm, gonna, I'm going to extend this study uh, tonight uh, on three additional points of the agape love of a spiritual mature believer. In John 13, 34, we learn a very important principle about agape. It is impossible to reach the standard that God desires of the word agape, it is, it is absolutely impossible to reach the standard that God has set apart from being a spiritual born-again person. You've got to be spiritually born again or you don't even get in the ball game. Now, unbelievers can agape, but they can't agape God's love. The object is different. I'm going to show you some of this tonight. I just want to tell you that. It is impossible. Listen, why is it impossible? Because I want you to go look back up there at John 13, 34, and this is why it's impossible. To agape by the standard that Christ has set and God has set for him. Look, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, watch, even as I have loved you. See the standard? It's not just love with all, love something. Look, an unbeliever can love something with all their heart, soul, and mind. I'm connected with Alabama football. I've been connected with people in the business world. An unbeliever can love something with all their heart, soul, and mind. It's the object that's important. We're not the only people who have, have the idea of agape, meaning to love something with all your heart, soul, and mind, but you can't love God that way. You can love football. You can love your car. You can love your house. You can love your jewelry. There are a lot of things you can love that you're told not to love. Love not the world nor the things in it, agape, like in 1 John 2, 15 and 16. We're told a lot of things not to apply agape to. 
Don't apply all of your heart, soul, and mind to these things. Why? Because they rust, they're stole, they're this, they're that. <laughs> they're a world. They're, they're temporal, right? I mean, we know that. Even if the Bible didn't tell you, you would know that. <clears throat> so, the reason they can't do it, because how you, uh, unless you've been crucified with Christ, you can't love as I loved you. So he sets a standard for it, and not the standard of the world. The world has a standard. The world, listen, the devil will talk about agape all day long with you. Love football. Listen, I believe in love, you know. Love this, love that. How about love Christ? No, oh, that's not necessary. That's religion. Don't get in that. It's just a heartbreaker. It's no good. We do know he plays these games, don't we? He can play ping pong with you. So look, John 3, 13, 36, when he establishes the new, the new covenant, the, the new covenant, he establishes a new standard of it. Agape. Okay? Agape. And it's always about the object. It was in the Old Testament. It was out there. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? There were things you, you were not to love that way. Don't love idols that way. Don't love... Don't love Esau that way. I mean, there are a lot of things. All right. So, what is requirements to love under a new standard? Well, you've got to be spiritually born again. First um, Peter one twenty three. You've got to be born by the Word, uh, the Gospel, the Gospel of grace, salvation. Listen. Secondly, you got to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians six nineteen and twenty. What don't you know that your bodies become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in there because you've been purchased with the price of Christ. Verse twenty. So, that's part of the package of salvation. Then you've got to be a spiritual person. And listen, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how bad things can get in your life, God says, I want you to agape that person. And there's, listen, the only way under some circumstances it can happen, and it's done that way, is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The flesh can't do it. The mind is not mature enough. It doesn't have the capacity. And yet they know they're under a commandment to love. And there's just no way. Yes, there is. Because God gave you the Holy Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. In, in 5, 16, it says, walk in the spirit, not the flesh. In verse 22, it says, here is the fruit of walking in the spirit. And one of the fruits is love. What number is it? Anybody know? Yeah. It's number one. It sure is. And so, listen, there are circumstances in your life where agape, you're, you know you've got to love this person, and you know now that agape says you have to love them without holding anything back, right? Does that mean all of yourself? And that's where you get no conditions. Unconditional, see? That's, where, that's a side effect of love with all of your being. The side effect is unconditioned. The other side effect of that is, is sacrificial. Who do, who, who do you have to sacrifice? Yourself. Because agape requires you to, do, to give all of oneself. Remember that last night? And your flesh cries out, don't do that, you fool. How many times do you want to have the truck run over you? Right? But God says do it, and you don't have the power to do it. You shouldn't have the power to do it. It's not about that. It's about surrendering to, the, to what God tells you to do and let the Holy Spirit capture your flesh. Let him settle it down. Let him bring it inner peace and let him do what you can't do because he is capable of doing it. He is capable of loving that other person in the spirit and in your flesh cries out, don't do it, you stupid guy. You know how many times you've been burnt for that? <laughs> Is 
Say, sometimes it, it's not good to reason within yourself, and sometimes it is. It depends on whether it takes you to the Word of God or away from it. If it takes you into the Word of God, it's a good thing. If it takes you out of the Word of God, it's not a good thing. So it's very important. So, you know, I put a bunch of scripture down there you're familiar with. You know, in John 1, 17, Jesus describes, uh, is described as full of truth and grace. Jesus Christ is full of truth and grace. Full of truth and grace. And, and listen, in that verse, if you're not familiar, in that verse, that is being contrasted to the law of Moses. See, most people just quote that part. Um, he's full of grace and, uh, grace and truth. What they fail to realize is that that overrides the law. Christ overrides the law. And then the writer comes out and writes a whole book on it called Hebrews. That's a powerful, that's a, John 1, 17 is often missed, not the part that he is full, that Christ is full of truth and grace. It's, they miss what, why it's important. Um, it's, it's uh, John 1, 17, just John. I don't know how John would feel about that, but this, I'm talking about just one of his books. The new commandment can only, be can only be accomplished, therefore, by spiritual believers. You have to be born again. You have to understand, I have the Holy Spirit. You have to understand how to walk in the Spirit over the conditions of the flesh and bad ideas, or what we call old man thinking, uh, old patterns. This is how I've always done it. And God says, no longer, because that way is not my way. And I want you to walk my way. And, and he's given us all, all of the grace operating assets to do it. We don't have to do it in flesh. That's the good part. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, he says, by this, he's been into discussion on it. He says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. Show you something. <clears throat> In John 4, 7. Beloved, let us one another, let us love one another, for love is from God. I mean, 1 John 4, 7. Everyone who, who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And he's talking about intimate personal relationship. By this, my, my verse, by this the love of God was manifested in us. Look, Paul says it another way in Romans 5.5. 5, that at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit enters your life and the Holy Spirit pours forth, pours out into your heart the love of God. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live, there's our word, might live through him. Look, look you're missing this. By this, seven through eight, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world for this reason, so that we might live through him. The life I now live, I live in Christ. The life I now live, what's that mean? I've been saved. Now my life is to be lived in him, not in the world. That's where I got saved from. See, so that we might live, listen, so that we might live through him. This love of God was manifested in me through salvation so that we might live through Christ. 
And boy, what a journey that is, isn't it? Holy catfish, what a journey that is. Boy, the thing is to smell the roses in this journey. You, know, you got to be a spiritual person to smell them too because sometimes there's a lot of stuff on the highway you're traveling. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Is that not a powerful idea? This is why I should be motivated to live through Christ. I should be motivated to do that. I've been saved to do it. Now I need to be motivated. I've been saved to do it. John is trying to motivate, isn't he? John in the fourth chapter in verse 19 is going to say, we love because he first loved us. My mind is going places I can't go. Well, in Revelation, the second chapter, this poor little church at Ephesus is misquoted a great deal. But one of the things that's important about this church is that they had, they had left their first love. They had left their first love. Now, we know what that is because John in 1 John 4.19, who wrote Revelation 2.4, told us what first love was, didn't he? Well, he said we love because he first loved us. And so people, this congregation of believers, just like so many people who get saved, get discouraged along the way or whatever and bail out on their growth, go into what we call reversionism, other people call backslidden, and now everybody's in a shuffle on how, how they're going to be recovered. The first church, this is the first church of Ephesus and the first church in the discussion, tells you all about this. This is the passage where he stands at the door and knocks, right? Right? Who's there? Jesus. Jesus who? The guy who died on the cross. The, your first love. Well, we've, we've moved on. We have a second or third love now. <laughs> now look. People want to get these people. You know, they left their first love, therefore they must not be saved. That's not possible. So here's what they've lost. Here's what they've, and it happens to anybody who gets in the flesh and gets into carnality and winds up in reversionism as a believer. Who's gone back to his, like a dog who's gone back to his vomit, right? And thinks it's a good thing. Well, I got a free meal. I know, I didn't write this, it's scriptural, I didn't write it. It's supposed to cause you to gringe, right? It's, it's not, this is not a happy idea, but then that's not a happy experience. In Acts 20:28, 20, we are told that Jesus Christ died, shed his blood for the church. It says church. Acts, it's a great passage, Acts 20, 28. This is what Paul is talking about. Or, or John is talking about in Revelation. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we're told that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, we're told it's there forever. John 14, 16, it says that when the Holy Spirit comes, up, comes in, he resides forever.
mean, I've met, a, I, I've been in this, I've been active in Christianity for a long time, and I've seen a lot of people leave the first love. I mean, I've seen people uh, got saved on fire for God and just wandered off into the wilderness for a while. And God loves them just like that prodigal son that did it. And he sets home waiting on him to change his mind. Right? And return to me. And he just lets lets his life become such a mess that even the pigs, he stinks to the pigs. I don't know if you've been around pigs, but boy, if pigs, if you smell worse than a pig and they turn away from you, you're in bad shape. <laughs> but didn't he have good sense? Because he remembered what he had lost was his first love. Life is about volition, isn't it? It's about volition. Because that's what the angel, it's all about the angelic conflict. You know, in the big scheme of things, not in the, not in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, but in the great scheme of the military war. The second thing is that when you look at agape from the viewpoint of Christ, there must be a basic need for the love of God in every human being, there must be a need, a basic need for a love relationship that was lost in Adamic sin because it makes it such a big deal. I believe that. I believe that in Adam's sin, the, before the sin, there was this wonderful agape relationship with God and Adam and Eve. Because you can see the effect of what sin had done in their life in regard to that relationship, shame and hiding and trying to come up with human schemes to get back in his presence, right? I mean, the whole fig leaf operation was to get back into his presence with some sense of peace and all of that. And none of it worked because only the blood of Christ now can be required. But I see from that that the only way that can be restored is through salvation through Jesus Christ, right? Because it's absolutely absent from the human race unless you go through Christ. And if you go through Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the, 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 because he, God loved the world. And the son loved the father and that combination got to us. When we come to the cross and believe that he died for our sins in our place, was buried on third day, raised from the dead to justify and bring in the whole package or program into my life spiritually, we have a sense of that. And listen, immediately, it is no longer God, our creator. It is God, our daddy. And the Holy Spirit, the moment he comes in, he puts the love of God, he he breathes in the love of God. He pours the love of God in us and at the same time establishes that God is our daddy. He is our Abba Father. That's a powerful idea. That whole relationship was lost. And, and you didn't know it. I never knew. I never knew. I never knew that was an unbeliever. I didn't realize that until after I got saved what I didn't have. I didn't know what I did not have until I got saved. I went, whoa. Well, that's a powerful idea. I mean, listen, one of my responsibilities as a parent and now as a grandparent is to connect my children when they're young to me, to family and to parenting, right? L learn the discipline learn that I love you, I love you agape and all that. And at some point, when you realize, when it dawns on you at some breakfast while you got, where you're doing what you've done every day of your life for umpteen years, 
you look across the table and it dawns on you that this child is not going to be here long. This child is being prepared and established to leave this home and go on their own. This bird is about ready to fly. Am I the only guy that did that? Listen, don't wait till then to prepare them. You know what parent they've got to be heavily connected with before they leave your house to go out and fly their own with their own wings. They've got to be connected that their father is God and God will be with them wherever they go. And you'd better get your kids oriented. And if you miss that trip with your kids, you better get busy because they don't know it. You better get on to your grandkids with it. And when they hit that about sophomore year in high school, you'd better be getting them that way. Because listen, you're not going to go parent them, right? Long distance. You're lucky to get a return on a phone call or a text. Uh, it may be three days later and you wanted it back three minutes later and it don't come back for three days later. I want you to know that bird's flying. He's soaring in the wind. And it's, listen, that's okay, son, soaring in the wind. But it, how important it is for him to know that God is above him and the only reason he has wings to fly is because of God. And the only reason he has air to fly is because of God. And the only reason he's going to make a safe landing is because of God. See, prepare that child long before. Don't wait to play catch up on him when he is going headstrong into the wind of the world. Catch it while you still have influence. I waited too late on most all of my kids. I didn't give a heads up early enough on it. I didn't do it. I didn't, and I didn't, I didn't mentor them in that idea. I talked about it. I shared it with them. My church believed it, but I didn't mentor them in it. And, and then after they got out of there, they began to fly and crash into trees and houses and, and barns and stuff. I went, geez, I should have done it. I, Ahead of the game. I, everybody I've ever talked to said, I should have been ahead of this game. I should have been ahead. Anyhow, I believe this is really important. Uh, I mean, who, who should check your children's salvation out? Me? Yeah, uh, me? No. no. I'll come over and do it. I'll be glad to come over and do it. Parents. But parents, and listen, the earlier you do it, the better off it is, isn't it? When you open that dialogue open with God with your child, the earlier you do it, the better off you are with it. The dialogue and the standard that you believe um, about God. A and listen, children, they listen two ways under authority. They listen by word and by deed. We do as adults too, but we're, we're more cynical. <laughs> They're not. They haven't been burnt 26,000 times yet. But they, they learn two ways by you. They, they learn by what you say and how you do what you said you do. And that's important. Listen, I love this in Acts 17, 27. They that seek God, this is unbelievers, they who seek God, that they would seek God, and this is why they seek, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. Isn't that interesting? He's not far from each of us. I mean, he's, he, he's, you could reach out and touch him, but you don't even know he's there. Just trucking along, hoping you will get the point. Just trucking along with you. And listen, what he's looking for, he's looking for somebody who will seek and grow up for him. You know, like a blind man. You know, every time you wander off, God wanders off with you. Because, listen, who, those who are seeking God are growth for them, and he's right there. So just stop a moment. Somebody comes along like you or I and says, uh, what are you groping for? Oh, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm groping for God. Well, boy, this is your lucky day. <laughs> 
Because I've been looking for people groping for God all day. All I've seen is men groping for women. I haven't seen anybody groping for God. So this has been a good day for both of us. Good. We know what groping is, don't we? Yep. We don't have no problem with that. All right. So I love Acts 17, 27 because it just makes sense to me. The God of this world, the devil, Matthew 4 the devil, uh, the God of this world, offers substitutes for the love of God. And we told it, he, we know that he's God of the world according to, according to the 12th chapter of John and verse 31 and 1 John 5, 19. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That's the unbeliever. In whose case the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones. In other words, those who are, are, are they're not unbelievers, they're unbelieving. I mean, they're unbelievers, but they're unbelievers unbelieving. So that they might not see, and this is why he veils. In other words, he gets them, he gets them pulled off into some kind of craziness. Yin, yang, young or something, some kind of. Middle, mid east uh, <laughs> philosophy of life, you know, if you've got yin yang or whatever these guys are, uh, it's going to, so, so that they might not see, and he veils up so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay? So he offers them substitute. Like in, in, in John, the third chapter, verse 19, in this great passage, well, let's see, I've got it coming up. Wait a minute. I'm on the second page if you're with me. In, in the meeting with Nicodemus, Jesus introduced to this religious leader the concept of God loving the world rather than the world loving God. See, religion says you got to love the world. Uh, uh, the uh, the that you ha have to love God, and they don't realize that God, God loves them. And how, how much does God love you? See, that is, so he had to get over to this guy because he thinks that the way that you get God's love is by doing, 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 behaving, being good, doing this, doing that. Then God will love me. He said, God loves you just like you are. Oh, Nicodemus go like, oh, whew, shoot. And see, Paul, this Paul is the same way. He went through this whole rigmarole, then got saved and realized that everything that he had done to gain the favor of God was dung. He called it dung. Right? Because it, 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 it's not going to get you there. So, what is interesting me that John 3 passed in John the third chapter, here's what's interesting is the way it's broke down. You know, we look for markers, don't we? Boy, if you learn nothing else from me, learn to study your Bible and look for markers. Now, when you read the third chapter in this Nicodemus encounter, it, verses 1 through 21, that's that whole encounter. Have you got your Bibles open to John 3? Take a look because I want you to see the markers. So let's just take a look at the markers because once I show you the markers, then you can study this on your own and you can do well with it. If you see the markers, how, how Christ is carrying him into this conversation uh, to, uh, to where he needs, what he needs to know and understand. Now, the marker that, I'm, the marker that I, I want to use is the saying that is truly, truly, I say unto you, or, uh, you know, truly, truly sayings. So, in verses 1 through 3, uh, he, we, we, meet in her, we meet Nicodemus. Uh, he comes to him, Rabbi, we know that you are, uh, and Jesus says in verse 3 to him, so here's one section, in verse 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, uh, you cannot see. So what I did is I broke, I broke this down, this, this, based on verily, verily, I say to you, and if you'll study this this way, you will you will, you will really see how Jesus takes, how he takes Nicodemus uh, theologically. Uh, because Nicodemus is a religious person uh, that, that needs to be brought into truth. He's got some, but he's got a lot of missing pieces to this puzzle. And so you got verses 1 through 3. Then you got verses 4 through 10. 4 through 10, he's going to do this again through 4 through 10. 
um, and then verse 11 through 21, um, I was looking, um, well, anyhow, look for this saying, verse, and then 11 through 21. Now, break those down in three sections of truly, truly, I say to you, or, or however he said that. Truly, truly, I say to you. Okay. Now, the, I want you to look at the third section. That's 11 through 21. 11 through 21, when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I tell you earthly things, and then he goes on, he tell, tells them about Moses and how uh, the serpent lived in the wilderness was a figure of the Son of Man being lifted up. We know that to be the crucifixion, and that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. See, he connected that out of his Bible, out of the Old Testament, he gave them, he gave them a reference point. And he tells them exactly, and that, that's, that, and Dick and Nemus knew that was messianic. And he's waiting for the Messiah to come. Jesus says, he's here. And here's how you're going to know it. Just as the serpent was lift, lifted up, you know, Moses in, in the wilderness. And he says, that's the picture. And Moses knew that. I mean, prophetically, he had that picture. Then in verse 16, and so now he's, he's starting to click. He's moving in this third section. He says, then he goes into the great 316, for God so loved the world. Then in verse 17, for God, not, God didn't send the Son into the world to judge the world, but rather that the world should be saved through him. Judgment is going to come later, isn't it? Hmm? Judgment of sin is going to happen either one of two places. It's either going to happen at the cross or at the great white throne. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the way it's going to work. Um and so he who believe, and so so he tells him that. And then verse eighteen he says, "He who believes in him, Messiah Christ, is not judged. He who does not, because he's because the judgment is on the cross. He who does not believe has been judged already. Adam's sin, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In other words, why why would a person ever go to hell because he doesn't believe he doesn't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ." He's under that judgment. He will remain under that judgment as a dead person will remain under that judgment in Sheol until the great white throne judgment, which then his whole case will be brought up and then he will be cast in the lake fire. This is a green ripper kind of thing, isn't it? This is, and this is what he's telling this guy. And this is the judgment. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And watch this. Men love darkness. See, the word love there is agape, agapao. And men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. See, see but now we understand that the standard of agape is to love something with all your heart, soul, and mind. Unbelievers could do that. It's the object that matters. For everyone who does, does and then he goes on to this, this discussion, just, just of interest. Listen, everybody gets a hearing. Did Nicodemus get a hearing? Yeah. Listen, if you grope for God, he's not far from you. Nicodemus proved it, right? He was groping for him, wasn't he? And uh, he knocked on the right door. Listen, that's a God thing. You just got to know when somebody knocks on your door and he's groping for God, you got to be, you've, you've got to step up the plate and tell them the truth. Now, this was some pretty hard stuff, wasn't it? I mean, there's some, I mean, he tells them uh, why he needs to be saved. He tells them how to be saved, you know, in the, in messianic terms. You know, for him, the crucifixion, prophetically was the serpent of wilderness being lifted up and yada yada but i want to call your attention to that third section for you to look at over and pay attention to that 
when you, when you go past that and you get into verse 36, he even tells you more about it. He tells you that those who don't believe, um, if you believe, the raft is removed. If you don't believe, the raft rem remains on you. Well, how did it get on me to start with? Adam's sin. It's 13 judicial sins that are just like death is passed on to all men, like in Romans 5.12. Holy catfish. In 1 John 3.14, I'm not going to get to the five stages. Apparently, you're going to read them, uh, the four stages, I mean. We know, I want, I want to read this passage. We know, apparently the Lord had, apparently, I, I'm not on my schedule <laughs> for whatever reason. Listen, he says, we know. Now, I want, I want to tell you something. Those, those people that, they know that the Greek language is important to us, connect certain ideas. I want to show you something. The word, oh, I want you to write this down now, because I'm not going to get to my, my four stages, talk about love. Love is important in all four stages. I gave you a lot of, you study down your own, you'll get it. You won't get it as well as I could teach it, let me say that, but just in case you want to throw me out. Um, but look, the, the word no is oida, O-I-D-A. Oida was so much used under the new covenant. See, actually, the word no comes from horeo. But this word was used so much under the new covenant teaching that they made. Listen, oida is the perfect active indicative. Write this down. It's a perfect active indicative of horeo. It was used so much in the new covenant in the church that they made a word out of it. In other words, if, if like in our Greek class, if they, if, and they will do this, by the way, when they get to the third chapter where we are right now and they get to verse 14, we may be there this week in verse 14. They will find that the word no is oida and they'll know that it's a perfect active indicative and they'll see that the root, the root to that word is oida. When the truth of the matter is, oida is the perfect tense of the word horeo. Isn't that interesting? That, that stuff kind of just interesting to me. And horeo means to hear something to believe it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God is the concept of that process. It comes from horeo to oida. But oida became a word. Now I'm going to show you, once oida became a, uh, a word of its own, in a, a dictionary word of its own. Then another Greek concept came into existence uh, with, we know that with hote, we know that, and hote is used in the Greek language after words of knowing or saying. So once oida became a word, within its own idea, whenever that's used and you want to declare what the person is to know in the oida sense that you've heard it, understood it, and believed it, and it's now a matter of, it's an issue of faith in your life. Do you understand oida? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. When that process goes through, you move from hearing to believing to application, that's oida. That's taking it from Horea around the cycle uh, to Oida. Oida is now ready. It's a firm belief and ready to go to application. When God sees it, he's ready to do it. Because now you have the capacity to respond to what you've asked for. The, which, which was the promise. Now, when you have Oida, it's a verb of knowing then you're, the Greeks are going to have to use hoita because you have a Greek, of, a Greek word of knowing. It requires oida, and oida sets up what the oida is about. The hota sets up what oida is about. Do, do, you understand what I'm saying to you? So the word that, and then it, it's what we call a declarative hote or conjunction. Is that spelled H-O-T-I? Yeah, hote. It is. 
it's a conjunction of a declaration of something. And it's a declaration of something. It's going to be used. You're always going to find it with the oida because knowing what? What do I know that is a firm belief? A firm belief. And so here we know. Now watch this. We know. And here's what we know. And that's oida know. We know that we have passed out of death. That's Romans 5.12. Into life, Zoe. That's eternal life. We've passed out of eternal death into eternal life. We've passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life. We know that. How do we know that? Because the, we heard the word, we believed the word, and the word has now become a part of my faith base. A specific passage, like Romans 12, 5, 12 or whatever. We know that we've passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life, and now he comes back to Hote again, and it becomes the cause, not the declarative. The first hote, the first word is that, is hote, is a declarative because of the verb oida. <laughs> I know, I know. But you see, we got another hote translated because, and that's perfect because this is causative. So you have two hote conjunctions connect to this verb to know. We know that we've passed out of death into life. That's a theological concept. That's oida with theology. Because we love the brothers. Because we love the family of God. We know that we've passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life because we love this, those that are the, have spiritual life. Because we love those who have, and he calls them the family of God. Isn't that good? Uh, it is. Trust me on this. This is really good. He who does not abide. Well, I, I didn't go on further with it. He, he who does not love abides in this death. He who doesn't have that love of God in him, right? He who doesn't have it. If you don't have it in you, you don't have the capacity to do it. And, and you don't have the want to or the desire to do it either. But... It just gives me a good opportunity to talk about, I mean, the, and, and here's my point. Didn't the English do a good job? I mean, the English translation of that is just absolutely, I mean, it's a, absolutely, now it helps a little bit when you see a little more of it, but the English translation, oh, that we have passed out of death and like because, see, they translated it as a cause, because, we, it just it just says to me, and I say to you, that if you have a, a, a King James translation, a New American Standard translation, I'm telling you, they were just on the money. Now, the difficulty with the King James is sometimes is the, the, the old English wording that we wonder what it means. You know, shamefaced and variety, and we go like, well, what in the world is that? Uh, which we're, we'll study in First Timothy 2. But, but I, I've got to quit because I've, I've ran out of time. So let's close in a word of prayer.